All right, so uh, Alex, uh, you're you're in a little early, but I figure this this topic is so big. I, I wanted to g- steal a few minutes from my monologue and, and give it to you. I don't think anybody's going to mind. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? Um, my name is Alex. I'm one of the co-founders of Sonable. Um, I'm also an audio engineer, programmer, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I like creating cool stuff for people who like to create music. <laughs> so based in Austria, maybe it's also interesting in Europe. Right, so, right. And it's late over there. Exactly, yeah. And it's a Saturday night. So I'm so happy that you're able to come and join us tonight. You're welcome. Okay, so your company, Sonable, one of the reasons we have you on here is because you um, you have made plugins that are using the AI, AI technology. And I want you to do do something for me here. Just explain a little bit about what AI is and, and, and how you would use it in, in your tool in the, in the sort of the most basic way. So um, basically what, what AI means, like on, in a very general broad sense is that a system is able to do something that normally requires human intelligence. So it, 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 it performs something where normally a human has to interact or tell the system what to do. Um, so what AI systems do is they are very good in learning certain tasks. And typically they do it by getting some example for this is some input and it should look like this at the output. And in between, there's a system that learns, okay, if I see this at the input, I have to transform this thing in a way that it looks like this at the output. Um, and this can be anything like in terms in, in image recognition, for example, it is I show you an image of a dog and the system learns that this is a dog. I show a banana and it learns it's a banana. So this is quite simple in the end. Uh, and for, for music, this can be much more complex because um, musical signals are constantly changing and so on, but the concept is the same. For example, if you take a AI-assisted equalizer, you show it a sample that has spectral problems at the input, and then you tell the system, and then you show it the sample without the problems at the output. And the system learns, this, that's the training phase, how to come from this problematic sample to the good one. And you do that with thousands and thousands of samples. And at the end of the training process, you can show the system a new sample it never saw, and then it will get this new sample and transform it in this kind of same way it, it learned how to transform the other samples and will give you a good output. Um, and the, the interesting thing about this approach, and, and, and this is deep learning, what I'm talking about is that even as a programmer, you don't really know why the system is transforming a sample in a certain way, because this is kind of hidden in a black box. Uh, and that makes it extremely powerful because the more data you give to the system, the better it becomes. But it also makes it a bit problematic because if there is some error in there, or if there is a bias in there that you don't want, then it's really, really hard to look at the data, what could be wrong with the learning data that the system does this or that thing. So, so it's on the one hand, it looks easy, but it, if you use it in practice, it's really, really difficult to get a system uh, doing things like, yeah, automatic queuing or whatever other task in, in uh, musical signal processing. Um, and that's one reason why quite often we combine systems. So when, when in music technology, we make AI systems, quite often we combine these deep learning systems with model-based systems. Because a, a model-based system is something where the system tries to mimic human behavior. So you try to mimic how, for example, a mixing engineer would approach the mixing tasks. And you have a step-by-step thing and you can look at each intermediate result. And if there is something wrong, you see why it's wrong and you can tweak it. Um, But there are limits to this because it's rule-based. So it's limited by the rules that you have. And maybe you forgot some rules and then there's a glass ceiling there. So what we do is we combine it typically. We have a black box approach that's really powerful, but we cannot really fine tune it too much. And we have a model-based approach. And in the end, we combine this these two systems into into one that's really practically usable. So okay. So so let's look at let's look at uh, one of the typical applications of this. Let's say equalizing. 
Yeah. Okay. One of the first questions I, I, I would assume would be, how do you determine what the proper end result is? <laughs> Good question. Uh, it's like um, you have to be really careful with data selection. So when we, we have a huge database of samples, like this is an example for our equalizer, for example, we collected a huge, huge database of samples. You have to kind of quality check all these samples. If they are like all the, the, the final samples are really well balanced, um, don't have any spectral problems and so on, no obvious ones. Um, and what we do then is we, this is something of a, not really a secret, but that's how we do it most of the time is, we, we take these good samples, we destroy them deliberately, we know how we destroy them, and then we take these destroyed samples and go back to the good, to the high quality ones. And that's how we can assure that, the, that the, the targets are always really good, and at the same time that the input is always bad. And, and, and also the way how, you, how to destroy samples and so on, what you do is this has a big influence on the performance of the system, because every problem the system never saw, it will not be able to resolve. So you have to be very, very, um, uh, you have to kind of uh, have to, uh, to use a lot of different ways to destroy a sample so that to make sure that, that everything that comes in later, uh, the system kind of recognizes and knows what to do with it. Now, so, so, so it's safe to say that the, the process is continuous. Do you, you have to continuously feed new material into the model right during the training like there there are two two applications of of ai um our system for example is continuously learning during training but that happens while we develop a tool so we have we have dedicated servers that, that, that do nothing other than looking at samples and, and training the system once the system is trained we export this model, like it's called a model. And then it, when the system reaches the user, it's no longer trained. It's just, it's using the information it already has. Right. In the future, that's, that's already some outlook thing. It would be possible that a user trains its own system. So let's say you are working on an album or so, you like something really much, and then you feed it into the system and say, this is like really good. And the funny thing would be that people could train their own plugins and the better they are mixing, the better the plugin would become. So it's, it's a funny idea for, for, yeah, for future development. And then by the same token, somebody's trained uh, algorithm might not work for another person. Uh, right. I mean, and, and that's the, the really difficult thing is when it comes to, ter to, to personal taste, because it's, it's quite easy if you get a recording and there is some resonance in there, some notch in there, and it's obvious, then it's rather, or that's the thing that we can definitely fix with an AI-based system, because that's just wrong and we prepare kind of we, we correct everything inside the track. Mm -hmm. Once it comes to taste, it becomes much more difficult to, to design an AI-based system because it's hard to say, okay, it, it's easy to say there was a recording problem, fix this resonance, but it's difficult to say, okay, this snare needs a little more bite, you know, and, and some other person says, no, I, I don't like that. So it's definitely the nice thing about the ability, if people would be able to train their own systems, like their own plugins would be, that they could perfectly adapt it to their style. And then it would, it would even support them in, in their mixing style. But that's something we are not there yet. So in a way we are there because we have custom profiles and so on, but this is not the, 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 the final goal we want to reach. Okay, now when, so, so do you have any kind of um, detection for, for the type of audio signal you're getting? For example, if you, if you have a, an input that's a bass guitar, it's, it looks very different than something that's a hi-hat, right? So th th does the model sort of adapt itself to based on the, the type of signal coming in? Yeah, <clears throat> like there are two ways to do that. Currently we use, like in, in our example with the Smart EQ, we use profiles. So basically you tell the system what to expect. For example, you tell it now expect the base and then the system kind of uh, internally uh, assumes that what's coming is a base. Um, another option would be to, because we have different models for different instruments, because it work, works better if you can fine tune a model for a different, for a certain instrument. And it keeps the individual models smaller. Um, because one problem with deep learning is that the computational effort is really, it, it's kind of exponentially growing if, you, if, if the model gets bigger. 
So that's why we have slices of models right now. Um, but theoretically, just in, um, if we would have infinite processing power, it wouldn't be a problem to have one big model where the first layer of the model just detects, okay, this is a base, and then the rest comes afterwards. You know, it's so. So the system will always try to, if it's presented with a new sample, it will always kind of try to find the closest thing it ever saw to this sample. And then from there, it will find the right transformation to the, to the correct output okay. somehow. It's, it's very simplified. But. Okay, so in a, in a typical application using a human being, the, the total number of, of tracks um, influence how they, how they, how they, what they do. Um, if, you're, if you have a stereo signal, there are certain, certain limitations to what you could do. If you have 24 tracks, with different instruments or 64 tracks, it, you, you act differently. Does your, or does the AI technology interact one track with the other? For example, does it, because this is a bass and then there's a guitar somewhere else and then there's a piano somewhere else and there's a vocal, is there any interaction in between the, <clears throat> the, the individual profiles at, at all? Yeah, um, um, yes and no. So we have, again, in our EQ, for example, um, if you have five tracks and you would put the EQ in every track, then these tracks would see each other inside the DAW automatically. And then if you join them into a group, they would look at their respective spectral distributions and, and would try to avoid spectral clashes and masking effects. Um, that said, there are two systems running there. So one system, is the one that optimizes each track individually. So that's the that's the system that would, yeah, that, 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 that's used if you only use it on one track. And then there is a second system that's only enabled if you if you add a second track to the to the whole thing. So it's kind of a two stage process mm -hmm. um, right now, at least. Yeah. So and, and, yeah, there are ways to. And how? I'm going to ask you a personal question. How, how confident and satisfied you are, are you with that kind of interactive uh, 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 process? Are you, do you think it's, I mean, do you think it's, it's good? <laughs> I think it's good. I think it's great actually, <laughs> but, but I still, I, since we, since we know, you know, it's, it's always what, what, what comes into a product is most of the time, just the part of what we did in research. So most of the time research is, at least one step ahead of what's in the actual product, mm -hmm. just because of technical limitations. And since we know what's possible, sometimes, or if you look at, for example, at SmartEQ, we know that there are this and this and this part will be better in the next version or in a, in a major update, because we know that it's possible. Still, what we, what we did, and otherwise we wouldn't have published it and released it, we are really happy with the result, and we think it's or it was, it was great fun doing it because we were not sure if it's working at all. So this was a really, this is the, the fun and risk, risky thing about um, deep learning projects altogether. If, if you are doing normal, uh, say normal signal processing, like, like the last 20 years uh, or more digital signal processing, mm -hmm. you, you basically always know that the things that you're going to do will work. You just don't know how quick you are or whatever, because you can, at every step, you can say, okay, until here it works, then there is the problem. You fix the problem and you continue, continue, and then at some point you're finished. With the AI, deep learning stuff, it's like you have an idea what could be possible. You start designing a model for this because there are different models how, to, how this deep net can be designed. And then you start training and then you, you start evaluating the first results. And for example, for the EQ, when we started, we had like half a year where we just didn't have any success because... Uh, we, we did some something wrong with the destruction of the signals. And that's why we never, when we worked with real world samples, it just didn't work. And we were like so frustrated. And then there was some point when we had one idea and we said like, ah, let's try this. And we, then we let the system learn like for 24 hours. Next day in the morning, we put in the, the samples and it was like, oh, and it was such a like fantastic feeling when we saw, okay, now we nailed it. And, and from this point on, we could optimize the system. But it's like, that's the great and it's also the sometimes frustrating thing when working with a with a system where you cannot look into every little detail, but you have to kind of 
really kind of get a feeling for <laughs> for how the system feels if you feed it this stuff or that stuff and so so it's really a bit it's a it's a crazy way of, of developing but it's it's fun too <laughs> now it's uh you you must rely on i mean human ears at some point i mean what how do you employ uh humans to kind of tell you the system sounds good or a system is doing a good job what's that process like, like? i'm like the, the first process is always just internally we have you know a couple of developers a core team and then we for example we have a new instrument profile and then we train it and then we send it around in the team and every because the funny thing is everyone programming at our company is also at least to a certain extent an audio engineer so everyone is at least musician they all have musical ears so up to a certain point they can kind of evaluate the quality themselves and once we have a profile where we think okay that's quite nice we have a network of people like friends but also international people uh, and we send them like beta versions more or less of these profiles and then they try it on their on their material and give us feedback if they're con like if they like it what they don't like and then we look at the because it's it has never been that we sent out a profile and everyone was happy because some people always have something to critique but at some point we have to decide okay is this like good enough for for now or do we have to tweak the data more again and again and again and and this can be like a process where it goes back and forth a couple of times and uh, at some point up to now we always reached a point where we we said okay this profile is good enough and we can we can uh, use it as a as a product ready profile so alex i mean you guys are deep in this stuff Give me a, give me some examples where you see uh, AI uh, being highly useful uh, in a in a typical uh, audio production uh, scenario. Um, different scenarios depends on the skills level and on the on the on the project. But like typical, one of the most like the first scenario actually where where we had really extremely positive feedback was people from broadcasting because in broadcasting if you have um onset sound for example for like did interviews and whatever and then then it goes to evening news and you have like two minutes of post-production for a five minute clip so kind of uh and these people just couldn't do that manually because they didn't have the time to do that and they they loved the the our tools because they with within five seconds of learning they reached a quality level that normally took them five minutes and they just didn't have the time. So this is this is one thing, if you really just don't have the time. Another thing is if you just don't know how to do it. So we have also a lot of people who, who are just starting to produce music and, and, and just have to get started with things like an EQ or compressor or whatever. And, and these people use our tools as a kind of really like learning tools. You know, you, you have a track, uh, then you let the system do its stuff. The good thing is you, you immediately have a result that could be used. And at the same time, you see what the system is doing. You know, you see how the EQ curve is looking like. And you and then you can try it on your own. And we also have uh, quite a lot of people who kind of have an AB comparison. Like they, they under A, they, they do their manual EQing, then they go to B, let the system learn, and then they compare the results. And then they see, okay, what did the system do? What did I do? What do I like more of the stuff I did? So it's, it's like having a second maybe more experienced mixing engineer sitting next to you. And, and this is like a great way, way to, to get into, into or to learn the craft, like the basics uh, of, the, of, the, of the mixing process. Um, and another thing I really like professionals um, who simply also save time. This is always an option also for professionals because uh, Everyone knows that music production is not the, the easiest job to earn money with. So time is, is money. Um, and at the same time, the, the, the way the AI computes, for again, with the example of the equalizer, computes the filter curve is, is more precise than, than you would be able to do it manually. Like, like to, you wouldn't be able to, to, you could use 40 filters, for example, to do that, but that would take like hours. Uh, and by being able to have this very, very detailed um, correction of of basic problems of the signal, these professionals can immediately start working creatively with the material, and they don't have to kind of first kind of fix it and then make a uh, go to the creative steps. 
but it's more or less kind of preparing the canvas for the creative work and then they start working. So, so depending on the, on the um, um, field, the benefits are really uh, like vary quite a lot, I would say. Um, you know what the pushback is against what you're doing. Um, you potentially could knock all these people out of, out of work. Your AI in the future is only going to get better and better and better. And eventually you'll put all the recording engineers out of work. Uh, what do you say to that? Um, I, I understand the, 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 the considerations. So I, and I think it's, it has always been the case with a new technology that people, first of all, they are kind of a bit afraid that this could take away some of, of the stuff people did manually before. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's important to, and, and that's also kind of a responsibility for companies like us. I think it's important to use AI in a sensible way at the, like at the points where it really makes sense. And these points are positions when it comes to like, as I said, preparing a signal, fixing problems and so on. And then when it comes to the creative part, I would say 80% of people who are using our plugins are mixing and producing because they just like the process of mixing and producing. And it would make no sense to take away the process of mixing or producing from people who do it for the process. So, so I, I don't think that, that the tools who would, for example, say, I click here and everything is done would be successful or would make any sense. I, and I also don't think that they would work. If aspects of doing things, the individuality is the thing that makes something special. And if you take that away from a mix of whatever, yeah, maybe for, you know, I don't know, stock music background elevator stuff. Yes, maybe that's AI created in the future and no one would care, but not, not the music that lives from like the, by, by the, from the visions that, pe that people have when they create it. So this will never be taken away by AI, personal opinion. Okay. That's great. I want to say a shout out to everybody watching. If you have any questions for the next 15 minutes while we have Alex, just type it in the chat um, and we'll try to get to some of them and, and, and pass it on to him and see if he can respond directly. So any questions you have, just, just pop it in the chat. I want to talk to you about uh, the, um, your AI compressor. How did you go about, how does anybody go about uh, um, training for compression? Um, basically similar approaches with the EQ, uh, just more difficult to make something well compressed bad again. So if with an EQ, it's, it's not easy, but it's easier, uh, with a compressor, it's much more difficult. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in this case, we had, a, we had kind of to go a mixed approach. So part of it we did by really having good samples and by using again, various tools to destroy the compression again, like expanding stuff and so on. Uh, and we also did the other way around. So we had non-compressed samples and we really, uh, like for example, sent, us, sent this to people who are good at what they're doing. And we asked them to process them in a way they would process them so that we have good before and after samples. Uh, at the same time, we have internally, but also uh, in our network, uh, quite a lot of people who did a lot of productions over the years and they typically have the raw tracks and they have the final tracks and you can also use this material. So it's always about getting the right material. This is, this is really essential for, for all the AI stuff. Um, and yeah, and, and then you take it from there. Um, and, the, and the system, uh, but I have to say with compression, also the evaluation, if it's like good compression or not good compression is more difficult or it was for us more difficult than with the EQ. Uh, and that's why we also put a lot of effort in the, in the compression process itself. So mm -hmm. AI taken apart, um, the way our compressor works uh, in broadband mode as well as with the spectral compression mode is different to how normal compressors uh, work. Uh, and this new process of, of compression made sure that we basically, even if the AI um, even if you leave the AI out, the results were 
are typically quite good. So it's more difficult to make something wrong with this compressor as with classical compressors. So it was a combination of, I would say classical signal processing, which was designing the compressor uh, itself, like the compress compression algorithm. Uh, and then it was the, the AI part where we had to, or that we used to, to make this automatic setting of compressor uh, parameters. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me go to the chat here. What do we have? Uh, what kind of a uh, programming language you guys use to uh, do your work? Um, we're like everything is programmed in C++ uh, mm -hmm. and we're using the choose framework for the plugins and the prototypical stuff for the, for the deep learning is done in Python. Okay. Uh, in PyTorch. Spectral compression. Mode. Okay. So I, I got a question for you. Um, it, it occurs to me that what you're doing is, is, is kind of difficult. Like why don't you just make regular plugins? And just make an algorithm. Copy, yeah. Copy the copy the LA two A. Copy the great EQs from you know SSL and Eve and so on, and just make that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we we could do that, but at some point we just never wanted to do that. And one reason is because we we started as purely engineering nerds. We we didn't have the the I don't know. Uh, we didn't start to, to, to build a big company that makes a lot of turnover, but we started because we saw cool algorithms, cool technologies, and we wanted to use them and build our own products. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we always had this, um, the feeling that there are so many tools out there um, and so many tools are out there at least twice or three times or four times, basically identical tools, slightly different UI, and we never really understood why. <laughs> and that's why we never wanted to become part of this, just copy something and make a nice UI. You know, UI is really important, yes, but, but it's really important for us also what's under the hood. Um, and while I think that, for example, emulations of existing analog gear and so on are really great and have definitely their, their place, this is just not something that we are, not something we are good at and not something we are currently interested in. So. We found our niche, I guess, and uh, no, it's yeah. great. It's great what you're doing. I mean, it's 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 groundbreaking, and and it's conceivable that you know, let's project out five, ten years from now, it's going to be better, right? <laughs> Def yeah, definitely. Okay, and, yes. then, and then and then, <laughs> then twenty five years from now, uh, I mean, it's just going to get better. So it's like a digital camera when they first started; they were, you know nothing but but they became really something so where does it end good question and to be honest i don't really know um i think in terms of correction so things like remove noise remove anything that annoys you in the recording this will become perfect like i'm, I'm quite sure that in 10 years from now you could probably take a phone recording and convert it in a way that it sounds like taken with an almost perfect microphone possible because things, uh, what we do now or <laughs> what, what is done now is that you don't, because normally if you have, for example, some, some noise on there, you take the signal and you strap away the stuff that doesn't fit. And, and, the, and the rest that remains is this clean, clean signal, but you, most of the time you hear some artifacts, at least if there's a lot of noise and so on. Mm. What, what is done now is that you basically take some vocals, for example, and you have a model that generates vocals and the thing that you hear in the end isn't the vocal at all. It's, it's the thing that's generated. And this is becoming better and better and better. And at some point you won't hear the difference anymore. Okay. So this is, yeah. Okay, so, so that's, that's a scary thought. Uh, I got a question <laughs> for you uh, from the uh, chat. I mean, it's a question I have as well. How do you train ambience like reverb? Like, how do you know where to end up? Um, in this case, we what what we tra it, it, trained the reverb was was a extremely um, delicate task, and we had a lot of discussions about that because uh, when it comes to reverb, you're quite quickly in a in a in the taste thing, you know what 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 fits to this recording and to this track and so on. So what we focused on there was that there are typical. There can be typical problems when you apply a reverb. For example, you have a signal. The signal has a bit 
like is a bit bassy. And if you then apply a reverb that has a impulse response or a character that, that further boosts the bass, then it becomes totally washy, you know, like bo boomy or whatever. Mm. And, and basically that's, and, and what, when, when you look at our reverb, you train, and then we suggest a, like a, a reverb matrix. So we don't have, we, we don't compute one reverb for, as an end result, but we basically have a, a, a big number of reverbs and you can browse through them. And by, by letting the system learn about the signal, it, it avoids, like it, it designs the reverb in a way that any, any characteristics of this input signal that could lead to problems together with the reverb are avoided. So, so it's, it's basically, it's a uh, tailored reverb for this specific input signal. Mm -hmm. How much of it you want to use or what style you want to use, that's up to you because that's why we, in this case, um, defined this uh, reverb matrix. Uh, and again, similar as with the compressor, we also uh, developed a new way of computing, a new way, yeah. It, it's our unique approach of, of computing the reverb because it's it's a it's a convolution reverb but since we have to be so flexible we had to design a commute convolution reverb that's fully parameterizable mm -hmm. and normally you use algorithmics algorithmic reverbs in that case um, and and what we do is we kind of we let the system learn the system tells us how the reverb should look like like time frequency response wise and then we convert it back into an impulse response and fold uh, convolve the signal with that. So this is all, like just this part was really really complex, but it was again necessary to 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 use the AI the way we wanted to. Mm -hmm. So so that's that's basically a funny thing, and I never thought about that. Is that we uh, at least two times kind of developed this special signal processing thing to be able to use the AI the way we wanted. So yeah, mm -hmm. very cool. So so now that you've done uh, you know you've done all this stuff. Um, Guys, I mean, you, your company, are you happy? Are you guys happy with the tools? Are you happy with the feedback? Are you happy with, you know, sort of when you listen to it yourself? I mean, are you, are you satisfied? Or I should ask, how satisfied are you? <laughs> uh, really satisfied. And it depends. It depends on, on the day. It depends sometimes on the samples. Um, but altogether, we are satisfied. And we, but we still see with every tool we have, we we have we we know that where there is room to improve, and we and for most of the products you already know how to improve it. It's just the question of okay, when do we improve what? Um, and in terms of feedback, um, it's interesting because it's mixed. Some people really love it. Some people say, oh, it's AI. Yeah, it's just a buzzword. I hate it. It's okay, you know. The good thing is everyone can try it, and if they don't like it, that's fine. Um, but uh, over the last couple of years, we also saw that people became like uh, people get more used to using AI because five years ago it was like no one talked about it, at least not in the music industry. And now there are people start to talk about it more and more, and that definitely helps us. So the acceptance of these tools that do something on their own and you're still in control and you trust them, it's getting easier to bring this message across now. Okay. Well, you know, I, I got to tell you, I mean, uh, we're, we're happy. Uh, when I say we, I'm talking for everybody using this stuff. And hey, Rico, I see Rico out there. Um, good to see you, brother. This man's helped us a lot in the past. But anyway, getting back, uh, Alex, I, we're very, very fortunate as a community to have a company like you uh, sort of blazing this trail. How many products do you have now uh, that have AI inside? Um. Like it's the it's the smart tools, which is the Q compressor and Weber. Then there is one uh, coming up in December. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, You're not going to tell us what it is. Uh, no, I'm going to tell you soon, but not yet. It is, but it's 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 kind enough. of also one of these, I would say, basic building blocks um, of a classical cool. production chain. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, hey, listen, man, I'm, I'm so, uh, I'm so happy that you took the time. We're, we're out of time. We got a couple more minutes here. Anybody got anything in the chat? Just pop it in there so I could, uh, we can ask one last question. Um, but uh, I want to say um, we also have uh, soundable demonstrations during the show uh, by Wilkes uh, Figueroa. He's done uh, this in the past.
he's, he's, he's very adept. So if you want more detail uh, on how these tools employ and how they work and how they sound on drums, how to sound on vocals, uh, check out Wilkes. I might even have the times that he's on. He's on at five o'clock. Look at that. How, how perfect is that right after this? And then he's on again uh, at seven o'clock. So you can catch those, uh, those, those presentations later on. So, hey, thank you so much, uh, Alex. Um, you can go to bed now. Uh, it's uh, 11 o'clock. 11, yeah. <laughs> thank you for taking the time out. And um, you're welcome. You know, uh, see you in the next show.